you said the music industry was particularly pathological. At least this is the reports you got. So why yeah. do you why do you think that is? Do you have any theories about that? And then why do you think your books got to be so popular among well rappers? Say there's a lot of money around, right? Huge amounts of money around, and um, and people are producers of music are very they have a very exploitative kind of model of business, which is mm. they. They seduce a first-time artist with a with a lot of money, but the contract is, and eventually they own all of the work, et cetera. So it was a very exploitive business model, particularly for African American musicians who were historically very exploited. And so it's it's like Hollywood, where so much of it is about pleasing people and having the right demeanor. So so 50 Cent, who I wrote the book with. He said, you know, he he dealt crack on the streets of Southside Queens. You know, he was a hustler at the age of nine. He saw everything, but nothing prepared him for the kind of Machiavellian games that music industry people would right. play. Right, you want to take take a straightforward <laughs> criminal over a psychopathic manipulator any day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, how did this partnership with Fifty Cent come about? The book was very popular with rappers, um, as I said, because of the nature of the music industry. And um, he reached out to me. He wanted to meet me because the 48 Laws of Power was sort of his Bible, as he expressed it. So I met him in New York, uh, kind of in the back room of the steakhouse. It was sort of like a something straight out of The Godfather. I was kind of the one white guy amongst the, his whole group there. I was a little bit intimidated, to be honest. I didn't know what to expect because he has this reputation. Ended up, he was really nice, and really interesting, actually a very kind of sweet guy, not what you expect. And we, we, I just finished writing my book on warfare and strategy, which is kind of my version of Sun Tzu's Art of War, how to strategize in conflicts, sort of like what you're talking about. And he has a very strategic mind. And he got, we got very, we kind of had a really nice connection. And I thought, you know, so much in our culture is creating these stupid kind of divisions and walls. Like you're in academia, you only write academic books. You're a popular person, you only write popular books. You know, you come from this community, you come from that community, and they should, they, you never communicate. And I thought it would be very interesting to write a book coming from two opposite um, backgrounds. You know, me, middle-class Jewish boy from Los Angeles, and him from Southside, Queens. Something interesting could happen from a collaboration. There's not enough of that in our culture, I believe, because even though our, our circumstances were very different, our minds were very similar. We were thinking on a similar plane that kind of transcended these sort of superficial differences. So I spent time with him and I was trying to figure out what is the essence of his power? What makes him such a compelling figure and made him not one of those people in Southside Queens who ended up kind of spiraling downward and ending up in prison? What saved him? And I determined that the quality he had was this kind of fearlessness. And it isn't the kind of fearlessness where you go beating people up or something. It's kind of an inner strength. He had been shot when he was like 20 years old, like nine bullets right there through a car window, um, kind of one of the bullets lodged in his mouth. And he survived miraculously. And it gave him this kind of calmness, like, I have nothing to fear. I almost died. Bring it on. I don't really care. And so... Mm. I, I observed him in meetings. I observed that kind of calmness and how he could take over a meeting, not by being super aggressive, but just by having this kind of dominant persona. And I thought that there's tremendous power in this fearlessness, not being afraid to be different, not being afraid to have conflict and confrontation, not being afraid of, of actually um, of death itself not being afraid of the reality of your situation on and on. So the book that we formed together was kind of a meditation on 10 forms of fearlessness. And I found, you know, I, I thought that I was a relatively fearless person, which in some ways I am, I seem agreeable, but I'm actually in some ways a little bit bold and adventurous. And, mm -hmm. but compared to him, I realized, no, I'm actually riddled with fears and just being around him and kind of writing the book helped me a lot in my, you know, kind of overcome some of my own limits and some of my own fears. So that's where that book Yeah, it's out. nice to have a model like that really close by, right, to contrast yeah. yourself with. Yeah, yeah, you can learn a lot from. So do you think 
you think that fearlessness that you saw in him, you think part of that was a consequence of that brush with death. How much of that do you think was temperamental too in him? Well, well, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a reckless fearlessness that a lot of people from the hood have, which doesn't really serve them very well. And it gets them in a lot of trouble, right? He has a very kind of strategic in, in under control. Yeah. Fearlessness. Hey, I got something cool and, to tell you about that. So what? I was talking to, um, David Buss, and he's an evolutionary psychologist, a good one. Uh -huh. We were talking about this uh, Machiavellian personality triad, the dark triad, the Del Polos, UBC. Yeah, okay. So here's something really interesting. Um, it's the bad boy paradox, they call it, that young, naive women are attracted to those Machiavellian types. Definitely. But when they get older and more experienced, they start to be able to see through that. The reason they're attracted to it, as far as I can tell, and I talked about this with Bus to see if I was way off on the wrong track, is that those reckless, fearless people mimic real fearless competence. And young women aren't good at distinguishing between the two. And so uh -huh. they get sucked in by the sort of psychopathic recklessness because they think it's fearless competence. Right. And then, of course, the guys who are doing that, they'll, pr they'll prey on that. Because they're right. trying to ape competence. But what the women are really after in their heart of hearts, they might be out for an adventure too, because there's that element of it. But they want that fearlessness that does go along with true generosity and competence and also the ability to keep, you know, real darkness away. So. Well, a lot of those people who display that kind of, uh, what you call mimicking fearlessness. Yes, or macho. It's, that's the yeah, macho thing. They're actually hiding the opposite. They're actually very, very riddled with insecurities. They're not, you know, and they're, they're, they kind of create this sort of bravado and this false front. And they go to an extreme to kind of project this machismo when in fact they're riddled with insecurities and that's their way of dealing with it. And I'm also interested in that, you know, you said that you channeled a lot of your shadow, let's say, into creativity. Did yeah. you see the same thing happening with 50 Cent? Oh my God, his music is incredibly aggressive and that's and and, and, and uh, to an extent it's kind of violent and i must admit it really appeals to me so um when i was why, writing why the, why that's cool because it's so interesting yeah. that so many rap fans are yeah. young white guys i know they, oh, i know yeah yeah but that's that's really psychologically interesting right because well, if if they've been yeah. coddled and their ambition has been squelched and everything about them that's aggressive has been shamed out of existence it's that's part of that attraction of that dark fantasy, right? And then they yeah. see that aggression manifesting itself and in a creative form in rap. It's not surprising yeah. that they're going to try to imitate that. It's part of that ability, that desire to bring that shadow out of the shadows and into the light. I was a little bit different in that um, I kind of understand, you know, my own anger. I wasn't so much coddled, but but what I really enjoyed mm -hmm. about the, his music is it just seemed very real. And, mm -hmm. and kind of the, the beat kind of catches you up in a primal sense and kind of the aggressiveness just seems very direct and very refreshing, by the way. Mm -hmm. And you could tell, you know, I say in, in my book, Mastery, that by a person's style, by how they write a book, by, the, by how they put language together or the music they create reveals something very, very deep about their character, about who they are. And so a lot of rap, kind of comes across as sort of false, like someone is trying really hard to have that kind of thug persona and it's not real, but it, it really smelled authentic with him. And the fact that he'd been shot and nearly died, you know, just kind of added to that aura. But there was something very real about it and very authentic in a culture where so much isn't real. I think that was the deep, deep appeal in a primal sense of 50s music. And when I was writing the war book, I was trying to get myself in a martial mood to write it. I would actually listen to his music to kind of put me in the mood to write some of the chapters. Hmm. That in hmm. Beethoven. That in Beethoven. Hmm.